Everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of a view from Tracy's Point, and we are here with an update on the United States versus Robert Sylvester Kelly. And before we get started, I want to let you guys know I am still having problems with my voice, but we are going to try and get through this. Um, after we last talked, I think I told you guys about I had went out in the rain and was losing my voice. Then I got a sinus infection. And so I'm recovering from the sinus infection, but it is still impacting um, my vocal cords. So we're going to try and get through this. So I may have to stop a lot um, to finish this video up. But um, let's start with today. Because I got some things I need to get off my chest, okay? You know, I try not to... Um, get involved with the shenanigans that goes on around this case you know i see a lot of things out here and i hear a lot of things and i read a lot of things but i believe that everybody is entitled to their opinion everybody is entitled to um, present information the way they choose um, as supporters you have the right to listen to whoever you want to listen to but I just be seeing some things out here that make me say, if you really support this man and you really want what's best for this man, why are you doing some of the stuff that you're doing? But we're all adults here. And, you know, I'm not going to get into arguments or whatever with people over their behavior. I'm just here to present the information as it comes across and, you know, you guys can talk about it in the comments. Sometimes I'll jump in the comments and share my thoughts and opinions. And I pretty much am going to um, keep along that. But today I do have to say something. So Jennifer Bonjean filed a motion. I believe it was on April 30th. And because I've just been struggling with my voice so bad, I didn't do a video on the motion that she filed. But she filed a motion to dismiss and hopefully I can get into that as part of this video. And so I kept waiting for the government to respond to the motion, but they never responded. And then the judge in the case, Lion Weber, or however you pronounce his name, stated that he was holding a hearing today and that the hearing was going to address I thought it was the motion that she had filed about delaying the trial because Jennifer Bonjean then later filed another motion, which no, was the motion to dismiss was the first motion. So I thought that's what this hearing was about. And I thought it was odd that he would be calling a hearing and the government hadn't responded. So I was like, what is this hearing all about? Well, it turns out that the hearing was just a status hearing to bring everybody together to see where they were and what were their thoughts and opinions. But then in the meantime, Jennifer Bonjean filed another motion. And in this motion, it was a motion for an extension of time. So we get to the hearing today and you guys know they provide a call in number and then people can call in. And I believe when I called in, there was about, I think it said there were 97 people on the call. Now, when you call in, you have to enter a PIN number. And once you enter the PIN number, there is a message that clearly states, you're about to join the call. Please mute your phone. And so at the hearing, the only people that are supposed to be talking is the judge and the attorneys. Now, what I thought was interesting about today's case, and I didn't, I don't really follow this Maybe it's because I don't follow the Chicago case as closely as I was following the New York case. Because there seems to be more decorum 
with the New York case. And I just felt like when Judge Dunley scheduled a call, it was just the United States versus Robert Sylvester Kelly. That was all the call was about. But here in Illinois on today's call, it was actually the agenda, the judge's agenda for the day. So he was hearing multiple calls or multiple cases. So you have all the attorneys for all the people and all the cases that he was hearing. They're on the call. Then you have all the people, the, the spectators, they're on the call. And it appeared that the majority of the spectators were to hear were there to hear the United States versus Robert Sylvester Kelly. So from the onset, from the moment I got on the call, there were people having full-blown conversations. And there was one conversation in particular. It was a man and two women. They were having a conversation on the call, okay? That is a court proceeding, a court hearing. And the voices sounded very familiar, sounded like a YouTuber that has been covering this case for quite some time. And I was just sitting there saying, why, why are they doing this? Why are, they have been on enough calls to know that their phones should be muted and that we can hear this entire conversation. So that pretty much set the tone for how the court hearing went. So you had them having this conversation, you know, about stuff that had nothing to do with the case. Then you had other people that were like chatter, chatter, chatter. It was just noise, noise, noise. So the court reporter or the clerk, the judge's assistant, whoever is controlling this phone, comes on and asks people, please mute your phone. I don't know how many times that woman said, mute your phones and people just kept on talking so at that point I was like okay this is intentional they're doing this on purpose because number one these are grown people on this phone this wasn't kids on the phone playing games these were adults on the phone and the fact that when you enter the code it clearly states mute your phone it, it clearly states that. So why all these people that's running their mouths on this phone did not hear, please mute your phone, is beyond me. But anyway, they claim they didn't hear it. The lady repeatedly asked, please mute your phone. This is an official court proceeding. Please mute your phone. And people just kept on talking. So at this point, I'm really listening because I'm like, some of these voices sound familiar. And some of these voices are YouTubers and are people that call into YouTuber channels. And there were people who claim that they are for R. Kelly that are running their mouths on this phone. And there are people who we know are against him. So it was both sides carrying on pretty bad. So then the hearing starts and there was one case that was heard about some guy got beat up on the van or something. Chatter, chatter, chatter. Then we moved to Mr. Kelly's case and people still talking. Jennifer Bonjean, I know, is so embarrassed at this moment that people who claim to support her client are on this call acting like this. And so the court reporter or whoever is controlling the phone from the courthouse is steady asking people, please mute your call. So she's trying to talk. She is hearing noise. Um, the other lawyers are talking. They're basically like, we can't hear. Let's repeat this. So then we get towards the end of the case. People are still on the phone. Somebody was at work and was, you can hear them say, how can I help you or something like that. There were people that sound like they were at their house and somebody's saying, what are you listening to? What are you doing? Oh, I'm listening to the R. Kelly case. Just all over the hearing, okay? So the judge, you know, makes his ruling on the motion to delay when she was looking for the 90 days. And we'll get into that as I wrap up this part about um, just people being ignorant on the call. So then it gets to a point where now you have people on the call telling the people that are talking 
to shut the F up. So now we're using profanity. Then it gets into a back and forth where people are cussing each other out. Then you have another person with a very distinct voice, male voice. Actually, it was two male voices that were very distinct. One is supposed to be for Mr. Kelly. The other person we know is against Mr. Kelly. And I'm not saying names because I'm just going by my ear and just having heard these voices repeatedly over the past three years and thinking, dang, that sounds like so-and-so, dang, that sounds like so-and-so. But I'm not going to say the names because I don't know 100% that these are the people. So then um, the people on the phone are being admonished by this one male voice who's basically saying that, and it's something that this person has said a hundred times over the past three years, which is another reason why I think it's him, where he's basically saying that you supporters are hurting him. Why do you keep hurting him? And this person is not for Mr. Kelly. This is somebody against Mr. Kelly, but he is known to say this statement over and over again you're not helping him. Like if you're for him, why are you hurting him? So he's saying that repeatedly on the call. Then you have another male voice who I, that sounded like a popular YouTuber in this circle of people that cover this case. And then he's basically yelling at people to shut the F up. And then you have women that now, like everybody's talking and they're dropping the F-bombs and you don't tell me what to do and blah, blah, blah. And this is why, you know, he's never getting out of jail and blah, blah, just going back and forth. Now, the, the hearing is over for, for Mr. Kelly. That's over and done with. The attorneys have hung up. Now you're delaying court proceedings for other people. And then you have the clerk who's handling the phone instead of just disconnecting the call altogether for people to call back in for the rest of the cases. Now she's yelling um, that the people for R. Kelly get off the phone, get off the phone. Um, R. Kelly's case is over. Get off the phone so we can continue court and hear these other people. And so I'm thinking... How ignorant of you to be sitting there saying, will the R. Kelly people get off the phone? It is still the United States versus Robert Sylvester Kelly. So now you done stoop to the level of the idiots on the phone that's cursing and just being belligerent and just not making any kind of sense. Because now you're saying, will the R. Kelly people get off the call? so that we can hear the other cases. And so I just thought that there was just so many breakdowns because at first when the people refused to mute their phone, I think she should have ended the call and started the call back up. And when people still refused to get out, you know, to stop talking and mute the phones, then at that point, the public should have been excluded from the conversation, you know, from the call altogether. And then it should have went to, okay, we need to move this case to the end of the docket so that we can get these ignorant people off this phone and they'll come back and have a private line for the attorneys. But to allow that to continue on, knowing that there were reporters on the line, that there, you know, it's not just people that support or against him, but there are actual journalists on the phone who are covering this case who are just looking for negative things to say about the case, about Mr. Kelly, about what's going on. And to just allow this to continue on, and it's just, I mean, like, my spirit was so upset by the end of that call. Like, I was like, I ain't doing this video. I'm not doing any more videos. I'm not covering this case anymore because I don't want to be connected to this type of ignorance. And so, you know, for me, it was both sides. It was people voices that sounded very familiar that was supposed to be for him and there were voices that were very familiar that are against him but whether you're for or against him this was a court proceeding this was an official court proceeding you wouldn't go into the courthouse and conduct yourself like this so why are you on the phone knowing that the judge can hear you that the lawyers can hear you that everybody can hear you and then you're just being ignorant and disrespectful. And whether you were doing it to make him look bad or make his supporters look bad or whether you were doing it because, I don't know, you thought you were standing up for him or you're sick of these people or whatever reason you're doing it, we're all adults here. 
And this man's life is at stake. And there's just no purpose and no place for this type of behavior, period. Okay, and y'all know, I don't be trying to cuss and I'm really trying to refrain. And then the last thing I'm going to say on this before I move on is, and I could be wrong, but it just seems like when Judge Dunley has her calls, there's just a little more decorum. And I do believe that when she does her calls, that the attorneys have a separate call in line and only the attorneys can be heard on her calls. Like, I don't recall ever hearing anybody being told to mute to mute the line at the hearings that Judge Donnelly did. And I could be wrong. I just don't recall it. And I just always feel like the call is for that case, that case only, and that the attorneys have a separate number that they call in. And then the court reporter or the whoever's in the clerk or whatever knows who to unmute and allow to talk and who else needs to be muted and seem like they mute everybody that calls in on that um, using that code. It's the same phone number, but a different call-in code. And so maybe Judge Lyon Weber needs to adopt that over there at the Northern District of Illinois. But my fear is that um, going forward, they are probably going to, if they can't come up with a system to mute the people on the phone to keep them from disrupting, that they are probably going to make the hearings not public or have like a special line for journalists, but the general public can't come in and listen to the call. So it will be interesting to see what happens going forward. Okay, so now that I've gotten that off my chest, let's go to the motion that Jennifer Bonjean filed where she wanted to where she wanted a continuance I thought I had that open um, hold on a second I thought I had it open okay I'm so silly I have been looking for this file and looking for this file and saying I know I downloaded this file and I did download it but I put um, 0109 um, 2022 and it was actually um I believe a five to 2022. Okay. So this was from Jennifer Bonjean. And she says, um, defendant Kelly's motion to adjourn the August 1st, 2022 trial date by 90 days. And it says now comes Robert S. Kelly defendant by and through his counsel, Jennifer Bonjean and respectfully moves this court for an adjournment of defendant's trial date. One, the government filed a superseding indictment in this matter on February 13, 2020. Two, undersigned counsel filed her appearance in this case on February 18, 2022. Three, the government produced the discovery in this case on March 7, 2022. Undersigned counsel was informed out of that gate, out of the gate, that defendant McDavid had filed a demand for trial and that the court was eager to commence trial as scheduled on August 1st, 2022. And then five, in good faith, undersigned counsel has worked diligently to prepare for trial on August 1st, 2022. But as trial approaches, it has become apparent that an August 1st, 2022 trial date is simply not possible if defendant is to receive effective assistance of counsel. And then six, at the outset, the case is complex, one where the indictment charges 13 separate counts of conduct spanning two decades. Although there is some relationship between the counts, the court, the counts involve six alleged minor victims. Count five charges a multifaceted conspiracy that the government alleges involved numerous individuals and continued for over 20 years. Seven, the discovery in this case is voluminous. The government initially produced 67 separate disks of material that undersigned counsel has been reviewing diligently and which does not include 3,500 material. And you guys know that 3,500 material is extremely important because it includes information that may be beneficial to the defense that the prosecution has collected 
and they have to turn that over to the defense so that they can use if it will help their client. So while some discs contain video and or audio, many of the discs contain tens of thousands of documents. And I am going to repeat that, tens of thousands of documents. Whew, tens of thousands of documents. Just by way of example, this too alone contains approximately 57,000 pages of documents, including financial records from various players and numerous financial institutions. Eight, last week, the government produced another 10 disks of discovery that undersigned counsel has not yet even been able to access, let alone read or review. Undersigned counsel does not see a scenario where she could sufficiently digest the discovery in this case, conduct an adequate investigation, retain experts if necessary, and be prepared to commence trial by August 1st, 2022. If undersigned counsel spent the next two months devoted entirely to defendant's case, something she cannot do, she would not be prepared to try this case on August 1st, 2022. To put number nine, to put a finer point on it, the indictment contains four counts of sexual exploitation in which the government alleges that defendant coerced minor one into engaging in explicit conduct for the purpose of producing four separate video clips. Undersigned counsel has reviewed the evidence in the offices of Homeland Security. One of the video clips is found on a tape that made its way to the office of the Cook County State's Attorney's Office in the early aughts under unusual conditions. The second videotape, which contains clips identified as video two and three, was only unearthed in 2019 when convicted felon and presumably disbarred attorney, Michael Avenatti secured the videotape under nefarious circumstances and then produced it to Assistant State's Attorney Kim Fox, who needs to be out of a job also, for various reasons that have nothing to do with this case. Number 10, according to the government, videotape one has been examined by forensic video experts, but video two has not. Undersigned counsel would be derelict in her duties if she did not at least consult with the forensic video expert and have him or her review the work already conducted by the government's expert and possibly in independently examine the videotapes that are at the heart of the government's case. This is particularly true where the tapes allegedly depict conduct from the late 1990s and there is no chain of custody to speak of. Indeed, the tape that came through Avenatti was apparently has apparently been missing for nearly 25 years. 11. Additionally, defendant harbors serious concerns about whether his case should be severed from his co-defendant's cases. Defendant needs additional time to investigate and determine whether a motion for severance is justified. All three defendants are charged with conspiracy to knowingly alter, destroy, mutilate, conceal, cover up, falsify, and make a false entry in any record, document, and tangible object with the intent to impede, obstruct, and influence the investigation and proper administration of any matter with the jurisdiction of the United States in violation of United States Code 18, 15, 19, which is count five. And then 12, the government identifies a number of overt acts in furtherance of this conspiracy including but not limited to one kelly calls a base production limited check signed by mcdavid to be issued to minor one's father in the amount of thirty thousand dollars two kelly and mcdavid cause a wire transfer to be made from a bass production limited bank account to pay an individual b to settle lawsuit that individual b had filed for payment for recovering and returning videotapes that depicted Kelly 
engaged in contact with minor one that had been stolen from him by individual D. And you guys know that this this is um, Lisa Van Allen. When they're talking about the individuals, it's Lisa Van Allen. Uh, what's the guy named Damon Pryor? And then there was another guy that was involved. So this all took place before the 2008 trial. And so they're bringing that back up again and including it into this document. And let's see. Because y'all know I done lost my place again, right? This thing gets to scrolling and scrolling. Uh, let's see. McDavid hasn't moved. Okay, lastly, the government. Okay, I'm sorry. Certainly intends to lodge. Okay, I, this was part of the hearing today, so I want to make sure I read this. But they were getting me all confused with this. Okay, three, Kelly caused a wire transfer in the amount of $80,000 to be paid to McDavid through his firm Winkler and McDavid Limited in September 2014. Four, Kelly caused a RSK Enterprise LLC check to be issued to Minor One in the amount of $1,150 in October 2014. And five, Kelly caused a wire payment in the amount of $100,000 to be made from RSK Enterprises LLC to agent of McDavid on McDavid's behalf. And then number 12, although defendant McDavid has not moved to sever, it seems like his defense will be antagonistic to defendant's defense, at least in some respect and vice versa. Frankly, it is curious that McDavid has not moved for severance, but McDavid's counsel has declined, as is their right, to shed any light on how they intend to try the case. Defendant certainly intends to lodge a defense as to count five of the indictment that would be considered adverse to McDavid and may require introducing evidence that would be potentially prejudicial or prejudicial to McDavid. Okay. Hmm. Financial records produced by the government reflect that McDavid had total control over defendant's finances for over 15 years. Those financial records reflect highly unusual activity that may become a focal point of trial. Undersigned counsel must be afforded sufficient time to develop this viable defense, which may include hiring forensic accountants. 13. Lastly, the government is charged has charged defendant with five additional counts of abuse dating back to the late 1990s. Each count carries a statutory maximum of life imprisonment. Undersigned counsel vehemently denies the allegations and must have ample opportunity to investigate these ancient aggravated sexual abuse claims that should have been prosecuted in state court two decades ago. 14. Although undersigned counsel's other professional responsibilities are not a primary consideration here, they should carry some weight. Undersigned counsel is currently prepared for defendant sentencing hearing in the Eastern District of New York, where defendant faces a guideline sentencing range of life. Defendants request that sentencing in the Eastern District of New York, New York case be adjourned until after the Northern District of Illinois case was denied. Separately, undersigned counsel also starts trial on May 23rd, 2022 in Los Angeles County, California in the matter of Huth versus Cosby, which was scheduled long before she filed her appearance in this case. The trial would not be a long one, but it prevents undersigned counsel from immediately prioritizing this case under until next month. 15. Counsel had hoped that she would be ready for trial on August 1st, 2022, but the case is far more complex than she anticipated. 
The discovery is extensive and undersigned counsel cannot be forced to trial without having the opportunity to review the material in depth and appropriately investigate the case. 16. Additionally, the fact that defendant is currently incarcerated makes trial preparation even more challenging. Undersigned counsel must review the discovery with her client to make sure to make sense of it. Reviewing hundreds of thousands of pages of documents with an incarcerated person is incredibly difficult under the best of circumstances. Here, the task is even more difficult where defendant has significant literacy challenges and must rely on undersigned counsel to read documents aloud to him. The process is extremely time consuming. 17, for the foregoing reasons, defendant seeks a continuance of 90 days and suggests a trial date of November 1st, 2022. So this was the sticking point of the hearing that took place today. And on the first motion that she filed, which was the motion to dismiss, because she says that a lot of those counts, um, the statute of limitations had run out in the state and therefore they should not be allowed in federal case. And so I don't know how that works out because I'm not a lawyer. So I guess maybe the, and I, and I am going to do a video on that because now that I think about it, I believe she did mention why the federal government Maybe there was a time limit in which the federal government could bring those cases to trial and both, so both the state and the federal statute of limitations may have expired. I believe that's what she said, but I'll do a second video to cover that because this video is turning out longer than I expected. So on the first motion, which is the motion to dismiss, the judge ordered the prosecution for the Northern District of Illinois to respond within two weeks from today, I believe it was. And then Jennifer Bonjean would get like a week or something to respond to their response. And then he would make his ruling as quickly as possible after they've had that back and forth exchange. And during the hearing today, she did state that she wanted to file an addendum, but he told her um, not to file the addendum, to just include it, whatever else she got to say, included in her response to the government. Now on this motion to adjourn for 90 days, he did deny the motion. And he denied the motion, basically saying, one, the man was arrested in July of 2019. We are approaching July of 2022. So that's what? 2020, that's three years. Like this has drug on for three years. He's got to go to trial at some point. He asked um, McDavid's attorney. And then another thing, I don't think any of the defendants were on this call. I pray to God that um, they were not on the call, that it was just the attorneys, because I think if um, Mr. Kelly had heard, you know, all this confusion going on in the background, he would have been very disheartened. So I think it was just the attorneys. So McDavid's attorney, you know, he's standing by. We want to go to trial. We want to go to trial. This is holding up his life. Um, this has been three years. This has been hanging over his head. And I can understand that because he has a professional business that he's trying to run. And I'm sure that being arrested in connection with this case has probably killed his business. And so at this point, he just wants to move on with his life. And if I was in his shoes, I would be wanting this case to go to trial so I could get on with my life. Okay. It's not like he has a relationship with Mr. Kelly because I believe he ended up suing didn't McDavid sue him and that's what some of this hundred and fifty thousand dollars and eighty thousand dollars wasn't that part of a lawsuit or he claimed that uh, Mr. Kelly owed him money or something but in any event they want to go to trial when they talk to June Brown is it June Brown when they Milton Brown's attorney 
she said she didn't mind waiting. She and, and I thought it was interesting that when she got on the phone, she says, I haven't um, filed a motion to remand. I haven't filed a motion um, to withdraw. Something else she said. And she said, I don't care if the trial get delayed or not. Because don't sound like she's doing any work. And you guys know that um, June Brown is very ill. And she probably just wants this thing to get pushed out and pushed out and that maybe he'll go on and see his maker and she don't even have to be a part of this. I'm not sure if his condition has improved, but I know that last year he was very, very ill. So she didn't care. Um, Jennifer Bonjean, of course, is saying a lot of what she said in this document here, but pressing the fact that you know, the charges against um, June Brown and Darren McDavid only call, um, come with a maximum of like four years or something like that. But whereas her client is facing multiple charges and life in prison. So, you know, excuse me if I'm not, you know, concerned by the fact that your life is on hold. At least your life is on hold and you're free to walk the streets, whereas my client is locked up. And then, you know, she points out the fact, like, you know, they are co-defendants in this case, but they're not sharing information. They are not working together to get all of their clients off in this case. So what is June, what does Darren McDavid have up his sleeve? Why is he not talking to her? And he's not under any obligation to talk to her, but hey, if we need to work together on a strategy to get both of our clients off on these charges like you know what's up but because you don't want to talk that means we're gonna have to come at you like you one of those witnesses on that stand one of those accusers on that stand and now this is what she said this is my interpretation of what she said um was her opinion or her thoughts on um, why are you over there being quiet why are you withhold, why are you withholding information why haven't you reached out to me and say hey let's go over this discovery and see like how are we going to strategize to be cohesive once we get into court to fight these charges and i agree with jennifer like why y'all over there being quiet why y'all ain't picked up the, the phone and say hey did you get this new discovery um hey let's get caught up to speed on what's going on with this case they haven't done any of that and that has her bothered and she is putting them on notice that i will come for you in that courtroom and it might not be good for you and it may hurt your defense what i have to say so maybe we need to have a phone call and talk this thing out so it doesn't come to blows and see what else did she talk about um, she didn't seem very happy with him and then one of the things that Daryl mcdavis um, attorney pointed out was that yeah we got the 10 discs that she's talking about but it only took us a you know an hour to go through the information like it's not that deep it's not that detailed so they were you know basically discounting what she was saying why she needed uh, more information and she pointed out once again that you know, in this indictment, although it's a multi-count indictment, it has multiple charges. And Mr. Kelly's part of the indictment is far greater than Mr. Brown and Mr. McDavid. And so, yeah, you may have been able to look over your part, you know, in a couple of hours, whereas I have, you know, a hundred thousand documents that I've got to review. And so it's a totally different thing. Don't try to compare our cases because th this ain't the same but still I would love to work with you um and see what your strategy is going to be and let's see what else did she talk about um and that was pretty much um pretty much everything that she said in the motion that she filed was her argument in the case and basically you know she wants to hire forensic specialists she wants to be able to talk to witnesses she wants to be able to do all the things that steve greenberg mike leonard um nicole becker thomas farinella 
the um, who was the mother folks that came through Devereaux Canick, um, Calvin Scholar. She wants to be able to do all the things that they did not do. She wants to be able to investigate these people, investigate their backgrounds, um, talk to people who knew them back in the day. You know, she wants forensic accountants. I've been screaming that since day one that, you know, when people were saying that he hired Steve Greenberg to go after Sony because Sony was stealing his money. Sony was not stealing his money. He was on the contract. He signed the contract. He knew what percentage he was getting. Um, R. Kelly has made over $300 million. I know a lot of people believe that, you know, he was worth billions of dollars. You know, your music catalog is only as valuable as the moment in time. And right now, you know, the, the catalog isn't of great value. It's not valued at a billion dollars right now. We know that for a fact. So... At the time that all of this was happening in 2017, 2018, 2019, when he was eventually arrested, his catalog was not that valuable. He had already made, so people say on the low end, you know, music experts, people in the industry, on the low end, he earned $150 million throughout his music career. On the high end, and the most likely number is $300 million. So people were saying Steve Greenberg was hired to help him with this, get his money, find this money that you know, was stolen from him. Steve Greenberg is a criminal attorney. He's not a tax attorney. He's not, you know, attorney that an accounting accountant attorney accounting attorney that deals with financial matters. So, and I said from the beginning, he needed financial forensic people, accounting forensics, people that can go in and trace his money back to day one, that have access to financial records, financial systems. Um, The guy who testified, the accountant that was hired, he talked about on the trial when he tested the case, when he testified about how he was showing him how his money, you know, remember he had the octopus drawing and he was showing him where all of his money was going. So he was getting his money, but it was what was happening with the money after that. And so I've said, you need forensic accountants that can trace back where all this money was going, who was authorizing this money coming out of these bank accounts, where are all the bank accounts, who were the signers on the bank accounts. Like that's the type of expertise that he needs to trace all this thing back. And trust me, where I believe Sony is involved, and I'll talk about it more in the next video when I talk about the indictment, when they talk about a RICO case, Sony should have been a part of the RICO case because based on the government's way of looking at things, there was no way in the in the early 19 uh, in the mid and late 1990s when some of these alleged charges and accusations and lawsuits and all of that stuff was going on that R Kelly had that kind of money sitting in a bank account more than likely with these cases that are definitely from the 90s where these women are claiming that they sued and they got all this money from him Sony more than likely was telling them, you need to settle this. Like this is going to hurt your, this is going to hurt your image. This is going to stop your career. You need to settle with these people. And Sony was probably paying the money to the people. He, they were get, fronting him the money to pay the people off. And so had they done the forensic accounting to trace back to where the source of money came from, even it was even if it was paid from his bank account, how did the money get into the bank account? Were there advances? They should have been pulling contracts and documents from Sony because every time they give these people the advance, I'm sure they're signing an agreement that this money is going to come off of their future earnings. And so the things that she's saying, that Jennifer Bungin is saying, I need to bring these experts in, experts in are the type of things that should have been taking place even before the indictments came down. Like the minute he knew that he was being investigated and these people were out there making these claims against him, that's what should have been investigated. Like you need to find out, you need to be pulling contracts and records to prove 
you know, that Sony was backing you and all this stuff, that Sony was the one that was telling you to settle with these people out of court. But we'll get more into that in the next video. And I may not do the video until um, tomorrow because, like I said, my voice is um, still bothering me. But um, just wanted to bring this to you guys. Um, I had these documents. I just didn't do a video because, you know, I was having trouble with my throat. But the hearing today was like, okay, girl, um, just eat a whole bag of lozenges, you know, so that you can get on here and do this video and talk about the shenanigans that took place in trial. So at the end of the day, she filed this motion. The judge denied the motion. The case will um, commence on August 1st unless something, you know, something unavoidable or unexpected happens. Um, he will be going to trial on August 1st. Jennifer Bungie knew it was a long shot because when she signed on for the case, timing did come up and she assured the judge that she would be ready to go to court on the 1st. And so she already knew. But, oh, the other thing that she kept pointing out was that um, it would be derelict of duty as an attorney to take this case to trial knowing that she has not had time to adequately prepare and in return this would be a violation of his sixth amendment right um to you know due process and a fair trial and um you know sufficient counsel and so that basically is for her i believe was just putting it on the record so that one of her appeal strategies if he's found guilty is that um his Sixth Amendment right was violated because she told them that she was not prepared to put this case on trial and they forced her to go to trial anyway. So that's it for me. Um, go ahead, leave your comments below, rate the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And until the next time, I shall talk to you guys later. Bye bye.